Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you so much um, for this day. Um, thank you for another day of life. Each day is a gift from you. Father, um, we want to lift up um, the incident that happened at the school as, as Jimmy brought out and pray for all those that are suffering so much right now. Um, our hearts do go out to them and we just pray that um, this kind of tragedy will lead to an awakening. We pray for an awakening and a revival in our country and that you would raise up um, good, honorable, and righteous leaders who would not be afraid to speak out and tell the truth um, about what needs to improve in our country. We pray that you would um, motivate and move leaders, especially leaders, to um, have the courage um, to do what's right. And meanwhile, Father, we just pray a special prayer for all those who are suffering so much. Father, um, we know that your truth brings light, it brings healing, it brings hope, it brings joy. And so we pray that your word will go out more and more and that we ourselves will be lights in the world and that we will carry the gospel with us. Father, um, as we enter into the study tonight, I just pray that um, even though we're looking at places and events, uh, what's behind it will shine through. That um, men of old dedicated themselves to you fully, 100%. And because of that, you use them in wonderful, amazing, life-changing, history-changing things took place. We thank you for two of them tonight. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and his life. We thank you for the Apostle John and the work he did, um, the last the last of all the apostles. Um, he ended very strong, as Paul did. And, and that's my prayer, Father, that um, we'll live this life daily for you and that we'll end strong like they did. Father, um, bless our families. I know that each one of us has um, special things on our heart, and we also lift those up to you individually at this time. Bless us, Father. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. He means the world to us. And thank you for sending him. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so where we ended last week is in, actually in Lesson 24. We're still in Lesson 24. And we ended basically with Paul's conversion, and we read several places um, that dealt with that. But I want to I want to finish with with this little homemade map right here. Um, you know that Paul uh, was converted in Damascus, right? He had gone there to seek out Christians to arrest and imprison them. And so he was in Damascus, and that's where um, he met Ananias, and Ananias preached to him, and, and he was baptized and became a servant of God. All right, so from that point on, um, what happens is, is Paul faces resistance in Damascus. And I don't know if you remember or not, but they like lowered him down in a basket outside the city to, to preserve his life at night. So he goes into Arabia, which I just want, this is just a side point, but what we think of Arabia is not what they thought of Arabia. Just like um, Asia Minor, we know that's Turkey, right? So places were, um, the borders and, and the definitions of a lot of geographical points um, in ancient times are, are different now. So Arabia was anything that was considered desert east of the Jordan River. So all of this is Arabia going down. It even goes up higher than this. So, when it says that, that Paul went to Arabia, don't think of like the Sinai Peninsula or something like that. That's not the case. He went 
lying outside of Damascus, but he came back. And we don't know how long he was in Arabia, we don't know how long he stayed in Damascus, but the total time of, of that trip and going back to Damascus, let me just say one, one thing about Paul right here. Paul is the bravest guy. I mean, not the bravest, but wow, is he brave. He would be persecuted, we're gonna see that tonight. And he would turn around, go back to the same places where he had been persecuted. And I just think that that really takes backbone. I mean, and we're to read, if I get to it in time, um, that, that Paul was not always, I mean, let me just put it this way, Paul's afraid sometimes. If you look at the end of some of the um, uh, writings, some of the, the letters, he'll, he'll ask for prayers for himself. And he'll say, please pray that, that um, I'll speak the word boldly, or please pray that I'll be fearless. He uses that word in, in two or three of the letters. I need to be fearless. Well, what does that mean? He's struggling with some fear, but we'll, we'll get to that. So, but, but he's brave. He goes out to Arabia, he comes back to Damascus, and then Galatians, and I'm going to go fast tonight, ladies, so um, I don't know if you can keep up, and I'm going to read excerpts because that's the only way I can do it. I, my daughter cheered me on. She said, you've got to do the, the damage today. You, you've got to cut things out. I know it hurts, Mom. You've got to cut things out. So anyway, it says, um, this is Galatians 1, 17 and 18. It says, and Paul's talking about after coming back, it says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia, that's when he left Damascus, and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem, and I got acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. So he did not go back to Jerusalem for three years. Okay, all right. Now, Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and following. When I came to Jerusalem, when he came, speaking of, of Paul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Um, he told how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. Another attempt at trying to kill Paul. And this is very, very early on. When the brethren learned of it, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So that's where we're going to end with this map. He's good. He, he came to Jerusalem. He went up here to Caesarea. And then they sent him off to Tarsus, where he's from. That, that's his um, native town. So he's back in Tarsus where he came from. All right. Um, now moving on to Acts chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 19. And, and again, I think I brought this out, but let me say it again. The, the martyrdom of Stephen changed the course of history. For, for the early church and for the spread of the gospel. And we just see that again and again, the impact um, his death had and the persecution that broke out as a result of that. Um, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, um, telling the message to Jews only. So, so 
they get scattered, and we know that they're scattered in Judea and Samaria, but it, it goes farther. They end up in Phoenicia, which is this area, Antioch, which is right here, and Cyprus, which is this island right here, which happens to be the homeland of Barnabas. Barnabas is Cyprian. He's from Cyprus. All right. Um, all right, now get this. All right, verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus, of course, in Cyrene, we're talking northern Africa, went to Antioch, so there's Antioch again, and began to speak to Greeks, also meaning Gentiles. Because up till now, the gospel is only being extended to Jews. Why? The Jews first, right? God is going to give his people a shot at Jesus Christ first, the Jews first, and then the Gentiles. Okay. Um, and they began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch to help see what's going on, to teach more, right? Barnabas was skilled. All right. Um, so we hear all these good things about Barnabas. I want to read it all. I'm not going to. Verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Barnabas says, this is, this is the spot for Saul. He, he can't stay in Jerusalem. He can't stay in Israel right now. But look what's happening here. Let me go get Saul. So he goes to Tarsus and looks for him and finds him. So he leaves Antioch. He travels to Tarsus and he brings, he brings Saul back. All right. Um, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, <coughs> Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And get this. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Wonderful. That's the name we bear. And we bear it with great honor, don't we? It's an honor to be called a Christian. All right. And so now we're seeing that outer stage of what Jesus said. Remember, Jesus said, you are going to, oh, let me just read it. And this is back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remote part of the earth. So now it's really going to go out. Now it's going to be extended to the Gentile world. And we know that's okay, because Cornelius was already um, uh, converted all the way back in Acts chapter 11, right? Okay, so... Um, let's go on now. Now we are in our lesson for tonight. Um, and what we're going to see, and I just want to read it because I just think it's so wonderful. I wasn't going to. This is what always happens. But, um, but I just think it's so wonderful. I, I want to read it. Um, if you turn to um, Acts chapter 13, and we'll see what's happening in Antioch where Paul excuse me, still saw at this point, about to change. Um, and Barnabas have been with the churches. I wanted to say what a great church this is. This is a great, great uh, congregation. Big, strong, on target, doctrinally sound, powerful, powerful. It, it's probably what Jerusalem means to the Jews. Antioch at this time means to the Gentile world. All right, so in, in um, chapter 13 of Acts, beginning verse 1, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who was brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, and while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. So this is the beginning of the first missionary journey. Um, and there, there are three, three main missionary journeys plus the journey to Rome. Um, so what I see in the expansion of the gospel throughout the book of, of Acts is it's always pushed to its next stage by the Holy Spirit. And we see that again right here. They are not taking it upon themselves to do this. God is always uh, giving the cue for the next step in, in the uh, gospel. And so they're going to leave. Um, they're going to go to Antioch, Seleucia. And then they're going to sail to Cyprus, which is, uh, which is where Barnabas is from. Okay. Um, they go through. Uh, the whole um, island, oh, I should mention this, uh, John Mark is also with them for the first leg of this missionary journey. Um, he is a relative of Barnabas, and he's young. All right, so they go through the whole island, and um, then they cross north, and we're going to start using our other maps. And here we are. We're in the, the work of Paul and John. And again, in uh, the first missionary journey, they believe, they believe, started in uh, 45, AD 45, which is approximately 15 years um, after uh, the resurrection and the beginning of the church. And of course, I'll, I'll just say this right now so I don't have to say it later, but they believe that most of the apostles were martyred and gone by about just just shortly after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. So about 70 AD, thereabouts. They, they think Paul might have died in 64. They think Peter might have died in 68. We know that James died much earlier. He died in Jerusalem. He was uh, martyred in Jerusalem first apostle to die. But um, John is the one who lives on, and um, they believe that John lived until um, about 1800, and he was very elderly. And um, it was between that last period of time, 70 AD and, and 100, 80, 100, that John wrote. John was the last to write. They believe the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then last of all, Revelation. And they believe that most of those, all of those books, were probably written between 85 and 100. And there's, you know, there's folklore. I mean, I, I personally, I take all that stuff with a grain of salt when it's um, in, you know, extra biblical sources. Know, that that he um, was carried in. I mean, it's wonderful. He was carried in on a stretcher because he could no longer walk, and he would preach from a stretcher when he was 100 years old. I mean, that may be true and beautiful. We do know that he lived the longest, and we do know that um, he did one big exile. He did. Um, he was exiled. He he didn't die. Um, a martyr's death like the others did. But um, let me see if I can find it. Well, they should have that here. Um, Patmos, anyway, ladies, I'll, I'll just show you on this one. Um, it's an island here. Here's Ephesus. They believe, I'm doing John, I'm getting John out. Uh, they believe that uh, 
at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, of course, everybody had to leave. And of course, if any apostles were still there, they had to leave. So they believed that John stayed until pretty much the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he came to Ephesus, which is also a very big church that was influential in the area, in the whole area of, of Asia. And he, he kind of helped ground that congregation. But he was arrested and he was sent to an island out here, um, west of, of Ephesus, called Patmos. And we know that is true because that's in Revelation 1, that he was exiled to um, uh, that island, which was a mining camp. Imagine a guy 70 years old doing hard labor in a mine. <coughs> but he was released, and he went back to Ephesus and lived the remainder of his days there. Okay. All right, so I just color-coded these. Oh, did you see the big map I gave you? That's just for fun, okay? I glued that up and gave it to you guys in case you want to try to do all four, the, the first, second, third um, journey on one map, and then the, the uh, trip to Rome. And what I do when I do it is I use four colors of pen. I do it with pencil first, because I always make mistakes. I don't know how accurate you guys are, but I, I, would, I need pencil. So I do the pencil first, and then I go over it. I use black, red, blue, and green, and then I make a little key at the bottom so I can see which one is which. Okay? But that, that's extra. I just thought I'd give it to you. Okay? All right. So anyway, here we are. And let's do um, the first one. And we're going to go to Cyprus. And we're going to go all the way through, and that's where he converts Sergius Paulus, who is the Roman proconsul. He's the governor of Cyprus. And his name also switches at that point to Paul. And we know him from that point on as Paul. And then they, they traveled up here to Pamphylia. And this is where John Mark leaves them. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Um, he was probably afraid. I mean, it doesn't really say. But later, uh, Paul does not want to take him on the second missionary journey because he left. He left and, and had to travel by himself back to Jerusalem. Paul doesn't think it's wise. All right. So um, then we're going to come north to Antioch number two. We already know that there's Antioch in Syria, and that's where that wonderful congregation is. But this is another Antioch, and it's called Antioch of Pisidia. And that's their first major stop in this region. Okay, so let's, let's go. All right. Um, all right, from Paphos, and that's what we just saw. Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to the city in Antioch. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. All right, Jews incited others, and they stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So that's their first stop there. They are expelled. They're forced out of the city. All right. Moving right along to Acts chapter 14, verse 1. They go to Iconium, which is the next city in that region. You can see it on the map, and you can see it on your maps. Um, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue, of course, always. Always to the synagogue first, if there is one. Always to extend the gospel to God's people first. All right. Um, there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Verse 5. 
there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and the, to the surrounding countries. So they're expelled in Antioch, they have to flee in Lystra. All right. Um, then uh, to, they're fleeing to Lystra, rather. Then some of the Jews, now get this, some of the Jews from Antioch and Iconium come to Lystra. They travel to Lystra. And they win the crowd over. This is um, verse 19. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Expelled, had to flee, now stoned. Stoned to death. OK. Um, but after the disciples, or we think he died. It, the, we don't know that for sure. He had a vision, and we don't know that for sure. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Would you do that? OK. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. So what you see happening is tremendous success, right? Many, many people hearing the gospel, many, many people being converted. But what you also see tremendous persecution and hardship. All right. Um, all right. I, I just want to read that again, verse 21, because I want you to hear this. They preached the good news in that city, and we're talking about Derby, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. What? You know, the places where you got stoned, Paul? The places where you had to flee from and were expelled? Yes. How brave is that? I'm talking both Barnabas and Paul. Do you love these guys? I love these guys. It says strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. And Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church with much prayer and fasting and committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Here is what I see throughout the ministry of Paul. If he converts people, he's responsible for them. And he will do his utmost, at all, even at bodily peril, personal bodily peril, to make sure that they have every chance to succeed and keep their faith. He will go back. He, he will write letters. He will pray. He will fast. He will do everything. He feels a responsibility for those young Christians that he had a part in converting. And that is just so admirable. All right. All right. Now, that's the first journey. Um, you know, and they always go back to Antioch. We always go back to Antioch. And they always leave from Antioch. Sometimes they go to Jerusalem first and, and report. And um, in fact, in this case, they do because there's growing tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. What you have in, in, in all of these brand new congregations is you have a mix of Jew and Gentile. And that's not a happy marriage, at least not at, at first, because the Jews want to hang on to the law. And that is not clear to them yet. It's not clear. I mean, I don't fault them completely because it's not clear. But um, they try to impose the law of Moses upon um, the Gentile Christians. And what happens in chapter 15, most of the chapter, is a great council in Jerusalem with all the apostles and the elders and Saul, I mean Paul at this point, and Barnabas, to find a uh, and with the Holy Spirit, because that's that becomes clear in this in this meeting and in the letter, to uh, to uh, mesh Jew and Gentile in all of these congregations, because almost without exception, it's a mix of Jew and Gentile. 
All right. All right. Now, chapter uh, 15, verse 36, second missionary journey. Um, they've gone to Jerusalem, and now they're headed back. They're going to go back to Antioch, um, and then they're going to go on the second journey. So, um, um, verse 36, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word and see how they are doing. Again, that huge responsibility to take care of the new church. I mean, he left those churches, please understand, he left those churches kind of in bad, bad situations. Um, he was expelled. You know, he had to flee. He was stoned. It's not going to be easy for those um, young churches and young Christians that are left behind. They're in a hostile environment, and he's going to go back. All right. Um, all right. So you know what happens. I won't go into it um, too much. Uh, Barnabas and Paul separate. Barnabas goes back to Cyprus and takes John Mark with him, which is fine, which is good, because John Mark had done okay there. This is a way for Barnabas to foster John Mark. And John Mark becomes a tremendous leader in the church later. And then Paul chooses Silas and they go north and this is called the, some people call it, the overland missionary journey. <coughs> because instead of going out to sea and through Cyprus, he's going to go overland. going to come back to these places where he went to start uh, in the first journey. And so you're going to hear him backwards. Instead of Antioch, Iconium, Mr. Derby, you're going to start Derby. You're going to Derby and, and that way. Okay. All right. Um, so he's going to come to Derby first. I'm in Acts chapter 16, verse, verse 1. Paul, speaking of Paul, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. Our beloved, beloved, beloved Timothy. He meets Timothy there. Whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, so they all know him. They know Timothy, young Timothy. And there must be at least some fellowship between these churches and these cities because Timothy is known in Lystra and Iconium. He's from Lystra. Uh, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, circumcises him, etc. All right, verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So going, going west, going northwest having been kept by the Holy Spirit. See what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit is instrumental on where the gospel goes, when the gospel goes, etc. Okay? Um, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. You think, wow, there's a lot of cities there. How come? Well, timing's not right. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have... have Another map planned out um, for, for Paul and, and Silas and Timothy. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. So they're, they're coming up here. They want to go to Phrygia. No. They want to go to Bithynia. No. They want to go to Galatia. Well, they passed through part of Galatia. They want to go to Mysia. No, 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 no. You can't go north. You can't go south. You can't go west. They come to Troas. And they land in Troas. Right? Don't worry. God sends them back on the third missionary journey. And he stays three years there. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Verse 9. Uh, 16, 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of Macedonia, of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
after policy division, we. You see that we? You know what that means? Luke. Luke is with him. Because Luke is the one who pins Acts. So whenever you see a we, there's, there's he passages, and there's they passages, and then there's a we passages. So whenever you see a we, Luke is traveling with them. So he picked up Luke in Troas. And they believe that Luke is from Tra Troas because Paul, when he goes back to Troas, it's all we, and then it's not we anymore. He comes back to Troas, and it's we again. So, so they get that from that, that they believe that uh, Luke uh, was probably from Troas. Anyway, all right, verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea, and we sailed sail straight for Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. So now we are in Greece, northern Greece, Macedonia, and we are in Europe. We had moved from Asia Minor, and we are now in, this is the first time the gospel is reaching um, a location in Europe. And I can't read all this. You know what happens there? He meets Lydia. There's no synagogue. So he goes out to a place of prayer outside the city, which is what they did when there was no synagogue. And he meets Lydia, he preaches to Lydia, she is baptized, her entire household, and he stays with them. But then he gets arrested because he heals a demon-possessed girl, and he gets thrown into prison, and there he meets the Philippian jailer. And um, he preaches the gospel to him. He's baptized, his whole household. And so the church in Philippi, what we know for sure, now has two households. The church at Philippi has um, Lydia in her household, the Philippian jailer in his household, and some others. And I'll tell you how we know that. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I want to say one other thing. I don't have time to read this either, but um, and, and this is taught. This is what I, goes with what I was saying about Paul's care for these infant churches. Philippi is not going to be in good condition either because the whole town was in an uproar. Um, Paul was thrown in prison, and then they figure out right. They figure out he's a Roman citizen, and they say, "Oh well, you can go now." Okay, and um, Paul said, uh, and they say, leave, you know, you can go and you can leave the city. And Paul says, no, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You, you come and escort us out. And you think, well, Paul, man, you're pushing it here. They're letting you go, go. No, he knows that what they did was illegal. And he does not want any shade any shadow left on the church there. This is what I believe. He makes them come and officially escort them out, and you know, they're saying sorry the whole time, because he wants to leave the church in good condition, legitimate condition. The guy who preached to you is no criminal. He's a Roman citizen, and he was not mistreated. And he was honorably escorted out of printed prison so that that church, which is going to suffer a, a huge amount of persecution, is left in an honorable state. Okay? All right. So um, look at verse 40 if you're following along. Um, it, Acts 16, verse 40, it says, After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them, and then they left. Again, he, he's supposed to leave town, but he's not going to leave town without taking care of those Christians. All right, uh, verse seven, uh, chapter 17, just pushing on, it says, And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jew Jewish synagogue. So Thessalonica, Philippi did not have um, um, a synagogue. 
And you don't hear about the Jews persecuting them in Philippi. It's other people. Um, it's the owners of that slave girl and all that. But in, the, in Thessalonica, there's a synagogue, so that's where they go. Paul went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and for three weeks, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned from the scriptures. Okay? Um, so he, he's only in Thessalonica a very short time. And if you read First and Second Thessalonians, you can hear his concern. I found out that you're still strong. I found out that you're living the Christian life. And, and now my heart is full. And now I really live. And he says things like that because he's so worried. All right. Um, verse 4. So some of the Jews um, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a few prominent, not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous. And they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. He had to leave. Now there's a riot in the city. All right, verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, so Berea is the next stop, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Berea has a synagogue. Now get this. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now that is a marvelous, not only example, but balance. Ready to hear, but always checking. Right? Ready to hear, but always examining. And that's, even though it was Paul, you know, I would take Paul's word for it, wouldn't you? But they listened eagerly, but they were not going to be bamboozled. They were going to check it for themselves and make sure that what they were being taught is the truth. Now, is that not a great attitude? Eager to hear, careful to examine. I love that. Um, they're, they're a good example for all of us. All right, um, verse 13. Now, here we go again. But when the Jews from Thessalonica, they're, they're going to Berea. The Thessalonian uh, Jews are going to Berea. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds. Remember, there was a riot, right? Um, and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast. Um, and then Paul goes to Athens, where he preaches that incredible sermon on Mars Hill. And um, he waits for uh, Timothy and Titus to arrive. Um, and then I'm going to go forward. Acts chapter 18, um, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There, now here's, here's another. This makes you feel so good. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because the Jews had been driven out of Rome. So there he meets another beloved set of co-workers, um, Aquila and Priscilla. And he lives with them. He, they work as uh, tent makers together. Um, and, and they stayed in uh, Corinth uh, for a long time. Um, all right, pa, uh, Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia in verse 6, but when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And this happens a couple of times in his ministry where the Jews just don't want it. They just don't want it. They're not ready. They just don't want it. Um, and Paul turns to the Gentiles. But he stays in Corinth. Is he afraid? Yes, indeed, he is afraid. Corinth is a scary place, very scary, for paganism, 
for a lot of reasons, for opposition. All right. Um, so let's look at uh, same chapter, 18, verse 9. Um, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. So Paul's receiving a new vision from Jesus. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you or harm you here, because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. This is one of the places that Paul actually stays the longest, 18 months in Corinth, and builds a large congregation. Problematic? Yes, indeed. Read 1 Corinthians. Problematic. But he loves them, and he pours his heart into them. All right, so they, they decide to leave. He's, he's in, um, he goes to Chincrea, which is close to Corinth, takes a vow, gets on a boat, um, and, and goes to Troas, uh, goes to Ephesus, goes into the synagogue, reasons with the Jews, and they say, stay. They want him to stay. Stay here in Ephesus and preach to us. No. He said, I will come back if God wills. And he sets sail. He goes to Caesarea. He greets the church in Jerusalem and back to Antioch. And now the third missionary journey, which I'm going to have to really barrel through. He goes through Galatia again, Phrygia. Um, he goes to Ephesus. I mean, Acts chapter 19. Paul took the road through the interior, the upper regions, and arrives at Ephesus. He enters the synagogue and speaks boldly for three months. But guess what? The Jews become obstinate. And so Paul retreats to a lecture hall uh, called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus. And for two years, he uses that lecture hall. They believe in the afternoon when it was not used, being used by the uh, normal teachers. And get this, all of the province of Asia hears the word of God. See that timing? He wanted to go to Ephesus earlier, and, and the Spirit did not allow him. He was traveling back. He'd taken a vow. He needed to go to Jerusalem. He was going to complete his vow in Jerusalem. They wanted him to come and stay in Ephesus. No, I can't do it. But now he gets back to Ephesus. He's able to use this lecture hall for two years. And all of the province of Asia hears the word of God. OK, and we find out later in chap uh, Acts chapter 20 that he actually stays an additional year in Ephesus. This is the longest he stays anywhere. Emphasis. Okay, I head back to um, uh, Caesarea, goes to Jerusalem, and he's warned, don't go, don't go, don't go. Imprisonment, suffering, all that awaits you. But he goes because God wants him to go. And he preaches in Jerusalem, and I'm going to go really fast here. He preaches in Jerusalem, and then um, he... And I have the map, but I'm not going to do it. Um, he is in the temple courts, and he is he is attacked, and they're trying to pull him apart, literally, by lip, pull him apart. And do you remember? Do you remember? Okay. Here's the temple court, and. Um, he, he is a, he's attacked here, and this is the Roman fortress, the fortress of Antonia, which has this huge staircase that goes right down into the court, because if there's trouble in Jerusalem, it's always at the temple. So the Romans built this here. And so the soldiers come pouring down here, and they rescue him. They have to carry him, remember? And they carry him up here, and then Paul begs for an opportunity to preach. And so from these stairs right here, Paul preaches to the Jewish people. Does that give me chills? That gives me chills. All right. 
Okay, in Acts chapter um, 9, and I, I have to read this. Um, doing Paul's life in two nights is not easy, believe me. I try it here. All right. In Acts chapter 9, and this is where he is on the road to Damascus, and Jesus appears to him. This is what Jesus says um, to Paul at the time at the time he meets him. Um, he says, um, verse 15, But the Lord said to him, Go. And, and, and this is actually to Ananias. I need to correct myself. This is to Ananias, but he's convincing Ananias to go and, and baptize Paul. Um, but the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to go and bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for, him, for my name. Is that not the truth? Jesus is given another outline like he did at the, the beginning of Acts. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Okay, This is an outline of Paul's life. And uh, let me explain that, what I mean by that. In Acts chapter 13, he first preaches to his first government official. We already talked about that. That was Sergius Paulus, who was the proconsul of Cyprus. All right, now listen. Cha Act, Acts chapter 2, he preaches to the Jewish people. Acts chapter 23, he preaches to the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish religious governing council of all of all Jews. Chapter 24, he preaches to Roman Governor Felix in Caesarea. Chapter 5, 25, he preaches to Roman Governor Porcius Festus. Acts chapter 26, he preaches to King Agrippa II, who is the grandson of King Herod the Great, and Bernice his sister. And then in chapter 28, we find him in Rome <coughs> awaiting his um, appearance before Caesar. So is that not true, what Jesus said about the outcome and the unfolding of his life? Now, I'm going to let you go. I, I want to say one more thing, though. I used to just like kind of like grieve for Paul. He was stuck in Caesarea uh, approximately two and a half years in prison. And I, he knew he wanted to be out doing and going and preaching and traveling and saving people. And then you see him again in Rome, uh, a minimum of two years, maybe four. And you think, man, Paul is stuck in Rome in that, you know, first it's in a rented home. For two years, it's in a rented home. And then, and then he's moved to the Martyr prison, which is a horrible place. But this is what Paul is doing while he's there. It says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear to the whole palace guard and to everyone else here that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fear fearlessly. So everyone in Rome knows why he's there, including the palace guards and, and everyone else. And then get this, this is the end of Philippians, you probably know this, but I'll say it anyway. Chapter uh, 4, verse 22, it says, He's giving his greetings. All the saints greet you, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. He converted, while he was in Rome, people in Caesar's household. Okay, one last thought. I believe that Paul's greatest work was in prison. Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, right? These books, right? He wrote, he wrote those books and, and a few others. 
in Caesarea when he was in prison, and later in Rome when he was in prison. Paul is still preaching the gospel today. Paul is still saving people today. All of the generations that have come and gone since the first century have been blessed and taught and instructed in salvation and come to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the books Paul wrote in prison. Not only his, but think about where would we be without those books, you know? So anyway, that's it on Paul, and next week is our last class, and you have your last little sheet there. And we, we've almost done it. We've almost finished. All right, let's have a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you for all this. Um, we can't thank you enough, and we thank you for all of the books in the Bible. Every single one has its purpose, its meaning, um, and its necessity. But Father, um, we, we thank you especially for the New Testament. We, New Testament. We love the Gospels, Father. We love Acts that tells us all the things you did to start and advance the church. And we love the other books, James and Judas and uh, Jude and, and Revelation, all of them, Father. But we do give you thanks um, for the books that you inspired through the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul that teach us how to be Christians that teach us how to live, that teach us where our hope is firmly placed. And we give you thanks and we give you praise for all of them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.